Oh Lord Jesus, glorious one, son of God, son of man, our king, our redeemer. How good will it be to enter into your glorious presence, <laughs> forgiven, blameless, with great joy. Whatever this life holds for us in the next moments, in the next years, perhaps even decades, all will be but a brushstroke, gone, and quickly dispersed in the overwhelming and infinitely increasing joy of being with you forevermore. Oh, how we long for that day when we, with the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the myriads and myriads of angels, and with all the redeemed from every tongue and tribe and nation and people, surround your throne. We will worship. We will worship without a shred of sin, without holding anything back, we will be done with the fight with our internal corruptions. We will be done with every fleeting thought that dishonors you, every wayward motive, every careless word, every dirty deed. And we will be free, finally free, with a new created universe to bask in your glory and enjoy you forever. Lord Jesus, as we look at your word here this morning, we ask that you would be honored, honored in our hearts, even as a foreshadowing of the way we will honor you in eternity. As we leave here, may we be honoring you with our lives as a precursor to how we will flawlessly honor you for all of eternity. Lord Jesus, we would want you to receive all the glory. And if you are besmirched in this world now, if you are scorned and mocked and rejected and refused and ignored now, you will not be so forever. And we would have nothing of this world if we could only have you and the scorn and the mockery and the neglect that may come with it. For you, Lord Jesus, are the treasure for which we would be rid of everything else. Help us now by your spirit to rejoice in your glory as you are revealed even in your word. We ask it in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I invite you as you are being seated to open your Bibles to John chapter 10. And we're continuing our study here of this marvelous chapter, a window into the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're coming to a climactic moment in the conversation Jesus is having with the Jews, that is the Pharisees, the corrupt religious leaders who are at the helm of an apostate nation. Israel was the people chosen by God to be the bearers of his word to be proclaimers of his glory before a watching world. And for the most part, Israel had rejected her God, neglected his word, corrupted his ways. And Jesus is here on the scene. We ended our time last week with the nuclear bomb Jesus dropped into this conversation, John 10, 30. I and the Father are one, he said. Now we pick up our text this morning in verse 31. We'll read through verse 36. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, has it not been written in your law? I said, you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, 
Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said, I am the Son of God. This is a remarkable scene. Jesus has been encircled by his enemies. They've sort of trapped him on Solomon's portico, that long covered walkway on the side of the temple. They have him. We're going to see the Pharisees here in this passage litigating a case against Jesus. They are investigating. They are inquisitors, although their questions are not honest and sincere questions. They are looking for a crime. They're looking for a crime of capital proportions. They want Jesus dead. This scene becomes remarkably climactic, in part because of the animosity of Jesus' enemies, but truly climactic because of the way Jesus turns the tables on them. Jesus here is playing something we might call in our day 4D chess. He will flip the script and turn the tables on the Jews. And while Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the other gospel writers, they describe in detail the trial scene at the end of Jesus' earthly life and ministry, John, in some ways, presents the entirety of Jesus' public ministry as something of a legal proceeding. And so I've given the outline this morning in legal jargon. I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. I'm carelessly using legal words to form an outline this morning for the sermon. The Pharisees' litigation backfires on them, and we're going to see that in four stages here this morning. The first stage of the backfiring litigation is the Pharisees' hurried prosecution. We see this in verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. We're just sort of starting here, and and they're already the executioners. This is a remarkable scene. The Jews here are the Pharisees, the religious leadership, those whom Jesus is taking aim at in this entire discourse in John 10. And it says here they picked up stones, and and literally the text tells us they carried stones. These are not pebbles. These are large enough rocks to be lethal. And it's not likely that rocks are just lying around on Solomon's portico. Solomon's portico is an an old building by this time, a solid building. It's not under construction. It is finished out. It is not likely that stones are just sitting around. It's not a dirt field. These stones are likely brought to the scene. This seems to be premeditated. And notice the word again in verse 31. Do you see it there? The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. This is not the first time they have come with murderous intent. In John 5, 18, after the healing of the lame man, they picked up stones to stone him. They wanted to kill him then. In John 8, 58 and 59, when Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, they picked up stones to kill him. In fact, in John 7, 25, it was such public knowledge that the leadership wanted him dead that the people said, is this the man they're trying to kill? They knew. And so here in this scene, the Jews have encircled Jesus with rocks at the ready. This is an investigation in search of a crime, an inquisition, an interrogation. And the men here are the investigators, the prosecutors, the judges, and the executioners, all wrapped up in one. What was so offensive so as to deserve immediate capital punishment? This, of course, is a response to verse 30, most immediately, where Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And Jesus was claiming there an an essential unity with God the Father. And the Jews understood this as a clear claim to deity, not simply a unity of purpose, not just having similar ideas but a claim to be God. And the Mosaic law had prescriptions against blasphemy. Listen to Leviticus 24, 16. The one who blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the alien as well as the native. When he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. 
And, and you notice in that injunction that the entire community, the, the nation, the, the, the people together are to do this, the congregation. This tight little mob doesn't quite fit the jurisprudence of Mosaic law. They're not truly motivated by the glory of God or the defense of God's honor here. In fact, Paul in Romans 2 quotes Jeremiah 9 to say the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of these very corrupt leaders. They are hypocrites. They are whitewashed tombs. They're full of rottenness and everything unclean. They wash the outside of the dish for appearance's sake. They are phony moralists, phony religionists, and they burden vulnerable people with man-made regulations that they themselves don't keep. They are motivated not by a desire to glorify God, but to keep their position, their power, their influence, and their affluence. Their minds have not been persuaded by Jesus' supernatural signs. Their hearts are not gripped by Jesus' gracious words. They only feel the threat that if the crowd begins to follow Jesus, they won't submit to their corrupt leadership anymore. They will no longer get to work out their oppressive regime. And so they must protect their turf. How black is the human heart? How depraved are we as a race? That just to protect some fleeting comfort, some slice of prosperity, some idol of the heart, a sinner will reject the plain truth, the truth right in front of him, and make himself an enemy of all that is good. You remember the backdrop of John 10 was John 9 and the healing of a man born blind. And everybody knew nobody had ever seen this kind of supernatural work before. And it was a work not only of marvelous power, but of compassion and kindness to one who is in suffering. And the Pharisees have made themselves an enemy of things that are good, just to protect what they cherished. It has been said that a sinner in his rebellion would kill God if he had the chance, rather than submit to him. And here, the Pharisees have that chance. They're ready to take aim. This leads to Jesus arresting cross-examination in verse 32. Jesus stops them from stoning him by answering, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? And this question causes them to pause the execution. Of course, they can't answer the question. Jesus here doesn't run away. He doesn't evade them and disappear into the crowd. Many times Jesus evades their menacing traps. But here, he halts their execution with a question. He is calm and he speaks the truth. And it's remarkable how freeing truth is. You don't have to flail trying to control your circumstances when you are standing on truth. Jesus says, I showed you many good works. The word good here is the word for what is morally excellent or even what is aesthetically beautiful. And so by pointing out his own good, his own beautiful works, Jesus exposes the Pharisees' division. Look back up the page in verse 19. A division occurred among the Jews because of these words. Many of them were saying, he has a demon and he's insane. Why do you listen to him? Others were saying, these are not the sayings of a demon-possessed man. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? Jesus knew that the crowd was divided. Jesus knew that the leadership was divided over his very good works and his gracious, compassionate words. He exposes their division. And notice what he adds here. Which of these good works from the Father are you stoning me for? This little phrase is not a throwaway phrase. Jesus is claiming that the things he was doing are God's things. Jesus is not independent here. He claims a source for his work. It is none other than God. He claims thereby a unique relationship to the Father. He is doing his Father's business. That is a contrast to the phony religionists who are not about his father's business. 
And he's not just doing the things that win God's approval. Jesus' works are the Father's commands carried out. This is full authorization. Jesus is fully representing the Trinitarian Godhead in his works and in his words. Jesus here is saying, everything I did was God's work. You saw me working, you saw the Father working. Jesus is not backing down here from this confrontation. In fact, this claim that Jesus' works were from the Father, ought to have compelled his listeners to some introspection. They should have dropped their rocks, dropped their accusations, and listened carefully. I mean, what kind of religion hates God doing good works? Helping the needy, aiding the vulnerable, easing suffering, bringing in the outcast. Jesus arrests them with this question. That leads to an accusation from the Pharisees, verse 33. This is a revealing accusation. The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. You see, Jesus' question here forced a clear statement from the Pharisees about why they think he did wrong. What is their admission? Well, we can't point to anything you've done. We're not actually stoning you for a good work. And we can't mention any bad ones, because there aren't any. They can't get him on what he has done. And this is a painful admission on their part. Jesus was perfectly innocent and completely righteous in all of his behavior. He never robbed or maligned or oppressed anyone. He never spoke an untruth. He never thought an unkind thought. His life was totally consistent goodness. Even his interactions with corrupt and murderous leaders of the nation could only be characterized as holy and blameless. It was the brilliance of his flawless character that got the darkness all riled up. Why did Cain kill Abel? 1 John 3.12 tells us, because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Why did the Jews here want to kill Jesus? Because their deeds were evil and his were righteous. The only indictable offense in Jesus was the truth. A man who actually was God in the flesh spoke and acted as only God in the flesh could. The irony here is that his unimpeachable deeds validated his claim of deity. They couldn't deny the works. And as we'll see later in this chapter, the works testify to his identity. They were offended as his identity. What Jesus did proved that he was the son of God. And notice how they phrase this, you being a man, verse 33, make yourself out to be God. Listen, Jesus isn't making himself anything. He's not making himself out to be God. Jesus simply is who he is. And a reader of the gospel of John would recall John 1. Turn there for a moment. We're sort of dropping into their conversation And the Pharisees would not have had access to John chapter 1 to read these things. But if you're reading John chapter 1, by the time you get to the Pharisees, you've already covered this ground. Listen carefully. In the beginning was the Word. Who is the Word? We find out in verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's Jesus. It's the second person of the Trinity. It is God the Son. It is the God-man, the Son of Man, the Son of God. The Word, the Logos. In the beginning was this Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. That is who is speaking here. Jesus has not made himself out to be God. He is not pretending to be something he is not. He is simply being who he is. 
the exact representation of God, the logos of God, the very word of God, enfleshed, incarnated in human form. The Jews were right to understand Jesus' claim to deity here. They're not mistaken. Their response, however, was not only to reject his clear teaching, his authoritative truth, his gracious words, his compassionate care, and his marvelous works, but they are set now to murder their maker. No Pharisee has come into being except through Jesus, who now stands in front of them. And they've got rocks in their hands. This would be a good opportunity to clear up confusion if Jesus were, for instance, not God. I mean, an easy defense, if, if the crowd is surrounding you, your enemies are opposing you, and they're offended because you've claimed deity, if he's not God, he could just say, hey, you guys misunderstood, I'm not God. Put down your rocks. And they could go about their business. That is not what Jesus does here. He could have said, heaven forbid anyone should claim such a thing. It certainly would be blasphemy for someone who is not God to claim essential unity with the Father, to claim to be the good shepherd or the door or the way, the truth, and the life, or simply before Abraham was, I am. It would be blasphemous for a mere mortal to say any of these things, for a created being to claim these kinds of things. I've heard several people tell me that they were Jesus Christ. Just waiting for the lightning to strike. Shirley MacLaine in 1987 in a television show called Out on a Limb stood on the shore of the Pacific Ocean. Just think about that. Little tiny Shirley MacLaine standing on the precipice of the world's largest ocean with her hands outstretched. Five feet. And she said, I am God, I am God, I am God. That would be blasphemy. Under Mosaic law, such blasphemy from a created being would indeed be worthy of death. Although death at the hands of the congregation, ostensibly after a trial with evidence... But this isn't the first time that God has appeared among men. Should the angel of Yahweh, when he appeared in the Old Testament and said things only God could say and did things only God can do and was worshipped, should he be accused of blasphemy? What about the burning bush? Blasphemous. No, any of the theophanies or the appearances of God in physical form in the Old Testament mean that the presence of God in human form here is not totally unprecedented. And of course, it wouldn't be blasphemous for God in the flesh to claim things and say things and do things only God could claim and say and do. And these are high stakes for the Pharisees. If Jesus is not God then the Pharisees are right to deal with him as a blasphemer. But if Jesus is God, then they are in a lot of trouble. Luke 4.29 records Jesus' first public teaching in the synagogue at Nazareth, his hometown. And they ran him out immediately to throw him off a cliff. First public speaking engagement. And they hounded him with murderous intent throughout his ministry. Why were they seeking to kill Jesus from the very start? Well, they were in line with their father's plans. Who is their father, according to Jesus in John 8? This got them riled up. He said, you're seeking to kill me because you're doing the deeds of your father. Oh, we have Abraham as our father. No, your father is Satan. Satan was out to kill the seed of the woman from his very birth and incited the corrupt religious leaders to murder him any chance they got. What a patient savior we have to put up in his whole earthly lifetime with the stony hearted creatures who would kill him when they had the chance. 
And he came on purpose to save us from our rotten condition. What a savior. We see then in verses 34 to 36, the fourth point in your outline, Jesus' stunning reversal. Jesus' stunning reversal. Read verse 34 with me. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are God's? Jesus starts with, Has it not been written? Literally, does it not stand written? And this is a great way to introduce Old Testament quotations in the New Testament. That is, the Bible was written and it still stands. That is, it is still authoritative. It still speaks. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It is unlike any other book. And so you get these introductory formula that describe or put forth an Old Testament quote, and it begins with, it stands written. Remarkable that Jesus quotes Scripture, appeals to Scripture as an authoritative witness. And notice what he says to the Jews. Has it not been written in your law? And here he's not going to quote extra biblical pharisaical regulations. He's quoting the Old Testament. And he says, it is your law. That is, it is what governs you. It is what was given to you as a stewardship, the very oracles of God. It's yours. It, it belongs to you. And frankly, Jesus is pointing out their accountability to God's word. This introduces a quote from Psalm 82. And, and here, like many other places in the New Testament, we get this introduction of the entire Old Testament called the law. Sometimes it's divided up as the law and the prophets or the law, the writing and the prophets. But here the law covers something like Psalm 82. It is a reference to the Bible. And it's like telling your kids, um, son, it, it's in your Bible. Well, isn't that everybody's Bible? Isn't that God's Bible? Yes. And it belongs to you in a really unique way. You're accountable to it. As someone who has close access to the very words of God, you better be eating this as daily bread. You better be taking it in. You better let it be renewing your mind. Your conscience better be held captive to it. This is how you know God. This is how you truly know yourself. This is how you truly understand life. And Jesus puts it all in their laps. This is the authority to which you appeal when you want to. It's in your Bibles. And then he gives this quote. I said, you are God's. Here, an exact quote from Psalm 82.6. And Jesus here is putting in front of the Pharisees this challenge. You wouldn't charge Psalm 82 with blasphemy. You love that book. You, you claim that book. You, you quote from it all the time to oppress people. And what we learn in Psalm 82.6 is that the Bible has a category for the use of the word God. And if you're listening to this on audio, I will be using air quotes. You can see them as I'm preaching. If you're watching me, if you're not watching me, just know I have my fingers up and I'm giving air quotes. The use of the word God or God's for beings other than the creator. And this happens from time to time. Angels, demons, false gods, Satan himself is called the God of this world, small g, and sometimes men called God or gods. And such use does not ascribe deity. It merely ascribes some elevated rank. Sometimes Moses or judges or those in a mediatorial role, that is, they are go-betweens and they represent God's authority or his purposes or his word to his people. And notice the continuation of the argument in verse 35, an if-then statement. If he called them gods, this if-then statement assumes that the first statement is true. And if the first statement proves true, then the second half of the statement will express truth. Don't put, my, don't put the Psalm 82 up there yet. I'm not ready for that. Sorry about that. Spoiler alert. Psalm 82 is going to be on the screen. All right. 
The if-then statement, if the first part is true, then the second part expresses truth. And, and listen to the if. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came. If he called them gods. Now we need to pause there and wait for the then in a moment. Notice this phrase, to whom the word of God came. And the Greek here is dramatic. The logos of God is the word here. That should sound familiar. That's the language of John 1.1. 1, 1. And, and Jesus is the logos of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. If he called them gods to whom the logos of God came, how dramatic is this scene? Now the logos of God has come and is standing before the Jewish leaders. This is dramatic. The logos of God is standing in their midst. The corrupt religious leaders have encircled him with murderous intent. And this phrase, the word of God came to men whom God called gods in the past. This phrase, the word of God came. It was a phrase that, re that referred to the word of God coming to David, to Solomon. Uh, the word of God came to Jeremiah, Hosea, Joel, Micah, Zephaniah. The word of God came to me in this prophetic utterance. Do you know the word of God is never said to have come to Jesus? And the word of the Lord came to Jesus. No, he is the word of the Lord come to earth. He is the word of God. And notice the parenthesis here, and the word of God cannot be broken. It's like that totality statement in Titus 1-2. God cannot lie. Here, the word of God cannot be broken. It's an interruption of the if-then statement. We're still in the if portion, and God interrupts with this, and the word of God can't be broken. That is, the word of God cannot fail, it cannot fall, it cannot falter, it cannot err, it will never be wrong. It must not be disregarded. And here Jesus is making an appeal from the details of an Old Testament text, and it is authoritative. That tells us something about our Bibles. We don't just get general theological ideas from our Bible. We can look at details. We can prove cases from details in texts. We can make observations down to the minutia of single words in their contexts, according to the intent of their authors from Scripture. And it is authoritative because it is God's breathed out word. Verse 36 picks up the then of the if-then statement. You don't see then in your English Bibles, but it is implied as the second half of this conditional statement. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, then, verse 36, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. What is the then statement? You're calling Jesus a blasphemer for claiming to be son of God. Number one, Jesus here affirms his claim, I am the son of God. He doesn't deny that. He affirms it. His argument here is not, son of God title is not a title for deity. We're all sons of God, so there's nothing special about me. Right? That is the argument of the Jehovah's Witnesses at your door. Uh, they love John 10, they love this little fragment of Psalm 82, and the point they try to make from this text is that, yeah, Jesus is merely claiming to be a son of God, nothing unique there, and we're all sons and daughters of God, so he's avoiding execution by denying his deity. That is not what's going on here. The argument also is not... Psalm 82 says men are gods, so it's okay for me to call myself God. It's a license to blaspheme. The word God just, might, just must, must not mean very much, so I'll just use it freely. That is not the argument here from Psalm 82. No, actually the argument here is an argument from the lesser to the greater. From the lesser to the greater. Here's the lesser. The scripture can refer to men as gods small g. Therefore, it should surely not be blasphemy for the Son of God to claim this title as God in the flesh. 
to claim an essential unity of God, for God to do that can't be blasphemy, blasphemy, because even the word God can be used at times for creatures. If it is appropriate for the word God to be employed for creatures in some context, then certainly it's appropriate for the one who is deity to claim unique sonship status. Furthermore, if God calls mere mortal men gods in Psalm 82, then you are about to kill the Son of God for being who he is? And notice how Jesus ups the ante in verse 36. What does he say of himself? Whom the Father set apart and sent into the world. That word sanctified there doesn't mean uh, making somebody holy who wasn't holy before. It just means set apart. In this case, set apart for a specific purpose. What does Jesus say about himself here? The Father set the Son apart and sent him into this world. Do you know what that means? Jesus is pre-existent. He's reaffirming what he said in John 8, 58. Before Abraham was, I am. He's reaffirming his relationship to his earthly cousin, John the Baptist. He is older than John the Baptist, even though he's younger. He's infinitely older than John the Baptist, even though he was born after him. Because he is God in the flesh. He pre-existed the world. The Father set him apart before time and sent him into the world. He is no mere man. He's not from around here. He is not mortal. He is eternal. The pre-incarnate Son of God was commissioned to come to the earth as a man. He was set apart in the triune Godhead for the task of redeeming God's people by dying in their place. The Son came to earth to take on human flesh so that he could die on a cross as a substitute for sinners. So that he could conquer death by emptying his own tomb so that he could rise again and make intercession for his people before the throne of God, and so that he could return as king, a true descendant of David, the son of man and the son of God, the branch and the root of David, the king who will come and make everything right. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So God the Father set the Son apart to become man to be the mediator, the sin bearer, and our king. He was set apart and sent. (laughs) Jesus is raising the stakes here. He is dropping nuclear bomb after nuclear bomb on this conversation. No one else could qualify as Messiah. No one else could be the mediator. No one else could be the sin bearer. No one else is son of God, son of man. No one else could fulfill the seed promise to Eve in Genesis 3 or the king promise as heir to the Davidic throne in 2 Samuel 7. Jesus is claiming all of these things here, set apart and sent into the world. And this would be blasphemy on top of blasphemy if it weren't true. Jesus does not back down here. He raises the stakes. He asserts his place with God the Father on the opposite side of the infinite chasm that separates created beings from the uncreated creator. Here's the creator, infinite chasm. Here's the rest of us, angels, Satan, the universe, humans, broccoli, everything else that exists. Infinite chasm in between. Jesus is not over here. He's over here. He is a God-man. Infinitely different from the Pharisees who cry blasphemy and who have encircled him in order to kill him. It apparently is a capital offense to speak gracious truth. Does this seem like a strange defense to you? From the lips of our Savior. Well, the Bible calls men gods, so it's not blasphemous for me to claim unity with God and take the title Son of God. Listen, Jesus is not on the defensive here, Jesus is going fully on the offense. This is 4D chess. We need to look at the psalm that Jesus is referring to. 
And we need to look at it in total in order to understand what he is doing. He has totally flipped the script on the Pharisees here. He has totally turned the tables. You can turn to Psalm 82 or you can look at it up on the screen. Why did Jesus select Psalm 82 to address the Jewish leadership here? This is the only reference to Psalm 82 in the entirety of the New Testament. Jesus has quoted this psalm in order to demonstrate who is really on trial in this dramatic encounter. You can read along as I read Psalm 82, a song of Asaph. God, taking a stand in his own assembly, will judge in their midst. How long will you judge unjustly and show favoritism to the wicked? Selah. Judge on behalf of the weak and the fatherless. Do justice for the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not and they understand not. They walk in darkness. All the foundations of the land are shaken. I said, you are God's. And all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the land, for you will possess all the nations. What is going on in Psalm 82? Why is Jesus quoting Psalm 82 while he's encircled by the Jewish leadership? Jesus is, in fact, claiming to be God and to fulfill Psalm 82 amidst the unjust rulers of Israel. God stands in the midst of his own congregation, his own assembly here at the temple to pronounce judgment on the gods, the so-called gods, the unjust rulers of his people. Just as Jesus in John 10 declared himself the good shepherd, thereby declaring himself to be Yahweh in the flesh, the fulfillment of Ezekiel 34. Here, just a few verses later, Jesus is invoking Psalm 82 to declare himself to be God in the flesh, judging the corrupt leadership of Israel. Let's take a closer look at this psalm. I've given some headings for this. It won't be on the screen, but... They kind of follow the verses here. Verse one is a hopeful prediction. And it reads this way. God, taking a stand in his own assembly, will judge in their midst. This is prophetic. This is predictive. What does it say? God will be in the midst of his own assembly and take a stand. What we find out in this verse is that God is in charge. God will take his stand in the midst of his own congregation. And we find out as this psalm unfolds that his assembly, the gathering of his own people, is marked by corrupt, hypocritical, oppressive leadership. Remember in John 10, Jesus was encircled, surrounded by the Jewish leaders right there in Solomon's portico. Picture that. They think they have Jesus trapped. They think they've trapped him physically, and they are trying to trap him in his words. But who's truly in charge here? God is running this trial. And the Son of God is not the one in trouble. God has convened this court. He placed himself in their midst. He said he would do it, and here he is doing it in John 10. The Jews thought they had trapped Jesus, and Jesus is fulfilling God's promise to judge the corrupt leaders. In verse 2, we have a searing indictment. Here's what the psalmist says about the leadership. How long will you judge unjustly and show favoritism to the wicked? Selah. They have perverted justice. That which is right and just, they've turned it upside down. The psalmist says you show favoritism or partiality to the wicked. Literally, the Hebrew reads, you carry the faces of the wicked. That means they they have something to gain by being a benefit, using their power, their position, their prestige, their leadership, their authority with the people. They have something to benefit by giving benefits to the wicked. 
taking bribes, lining their pockets. They are in cahoots with those who hate God. They're playing favorites, and their favorites are the bad guys. The leaders of God's people were supposed to be truthful, compassionate, just, helping the vulnerable and needy, and this is all abuse for personal gain, abuse of authority. And then we get this word, selah. It's a Hebrew word. It's a musical pause. It's instruction to the congregation who was supposed to sing this song, which helped commit it to memory. It, it put it in the collective conscience of the nation of Israel. And here at the selah, you're supposed to pause, to meditate, to ponder, to think about what you just sang. Insert guitar solo. That's what guitar solos are for, uh, or a lyre or some stringed instrument, some sort of musical interlude for you to pause and meditate and ponder the words you just sang. So ponder this, unjust judging and favoritism to the wicked. Let that sink in. Verses three and four give us a pointed corrective Appointed corrective. What should they do differently? Judge on behalf of the weak and fatherless. Do justice for the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. What should the leaders have been doing? Defending the poor and the orphan. They should have been causing justice to happen for those being in want. They should have been rescuers of those in dire straits. What should they have done for the man born blind in John 9? Meet his needs, care for him, feed him spiritually, protect him. If the vulnerable are in the grasp of the wicked, the psalmist writes, deliver them. But like in Ezekiel 34, you remember there the bad shepherds of Israel were actually devouring the sheep. They were fleecing the sheep for the wool, and then they were actually eating the sheep they were supposed to protect from wolves. They were the wolves, acting as shepherds. And you remember in Ezekiel 34, fulfilled by Jesus in John 10, God himself promised he would come personally and deliver his sheep out of the hands of the bad shepherds. Here, the command to the leaders of Israel was deliver God's people out of the hand of the wicked. And the leaders are the wicked. God himself must come and deliver his people out of their hand. Jesus is fulfilling that very thing. Fourthly, in the psalm, there is a comprehensive assessment. Psalm 82.5. They know not, speaking of the leadership, they understand not, they walk in darkness. All the foundations of the land are shaken. This assessment from God of their spiritual condition is comprehensive. It describes not only their spiritual and mental state, but the effects of their spiritual condition on the nation, on the land itself. They don't know. They don't understand. They walk in darkness. Walk is a metaphor for the whole course of life. They are culpably blind. Theirs is guilty ignorance. They walk about in darkness. John 3 has already told us, light came into the world and men love darkness rather than light. The light shines in the darkness. John 1. Here, this is the darkness. These corrupt leaders, they walk about in darkness. They lead God's people into darkness. They make disciples of darkness. They are the darkness. And the darkness despises the light. What is the result for the nation? The psalmist writes, the foundations of the land are shaken. That which is supposed to be stable, rock solid, steady. It's unsteady, unhelpful. God's people could not enjoy God's rest in God's promised land under the corrupt leadership of the unjust rulers. Like priests, like people, everything was a mess when the leaders were corrupt. That leads to a divine taunt in verses 6 and 7 of Psalm 82. 
the psalmist says, and he may be giving God's voice here, or he may be reflecting his own as the psalmist says, you are God's and all of you are sons of the most high. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like one of the princes. The psalmist here acknowledges high responsibility, high privilege, high accountability, an elevated status of those in positions of power and influence. But this is a sneer, a derision, a jab. He is calling out their usurpation of high position. He's calling out their oppression of God's precious people. God's here in this context is not a title of honor, but of corrupt power. It's not a title of God glorifying mediatorial responsibility, but of dereliction of duty, wielding position and influence to stuff their pockets and maintain their position. What does the psalmist say? What does God say to these corrupt, unjust judges? You will die. You may have lifted yourself up to the place of God, telling people to do this and that and not lifting a finger to help them with their burdens, making rules you don't follow, claiming to speak for God. You might think of yourselves as little gods, but you will die. You'll die like mere men, like any of the princes, and the death you will face is a serious one, an eternal one. The second death. This is the declaration of a sentence of eternal judgment. And there's no telling how long corruption will last in any given corrupt administration of leadership. Maybe they reign for months. Maybe they're at the helm for years. Maybe they get decades. But in God's timing, all of that over in a flash. Psalm 73 indicates they are on slippery places that lead to destruction. Don't envy them. Don't fear them. Don't be jealous of them. They are headed toward what the Bible calls a second death. The lake of fire. Eternal judgment under the righteous wrath of God. Who will hold them accountable for their unjust rulership. The psalm closes in verse 8 with a hopeful invocation. This is the Maranatha of the Old Testament, the come Lord Jesus. Notice what the psalmist writes. Arise, O God, judge the land, for you will possess all the nations. This Maranatha on the lips of the psalmist is a thy kingdom come. Rise up, O God, and and judge these unjust rulers on behalf of your people. Make everything right. Set everything straight. And it comes with an eschatological exclamation point. You will possess or you will inherit all the nations. The focus at first is on the land, the land of Israel, the land of promise. Ha'aretz in the Hebrew, it is, it is the land that is in keeping with all of God's covenant promises for his people Israel, and it must be judged because the nation is in an apostate condition, spiritually bankrupt, headed up by corrupt religious leaders. But the appeal here is based on a broader promise that God will possess all the nations. We saw this already in John 10. Jesus would go get sheep not of this fold. He would go get Gentiles from every tongue and tribe and nation and people. And when he comes and reigns on David's throne, he will rule all the earth with a rod of iron, Psalm 2. This is the psalm Jesus quotes to the Pharisees. He knew that they knew what he was saying. They knew their Bibles. They sang this song. They paused at the guitar solo. The word of God had come to them. And they chose darkness and hypocrisy instead of light and truth. And now the logos of God is standing in their midst, declaring judgment against them in fulfillment of Psalm 82. Jesus' declaration is not, I'm not God. Jesus' declaration is Psalm 82. God is here. 
inside your circle, and you're all in a lot of trouble. This is a remarkable, climactic, overt declaration on Jesus' lips of his own deity, his fulfillment of Scripture, and the reason he here, the reason he came. The game is up. You're in a heap of trouble, and your sentence is death. There are some implications for us to think through as we look at this passage. First of all, just think about your Bibles. The Word of God can't be broken. And the reference to a few words in an Old Testament text settles an issue authoritatively. Jesus can appeal to the details of a psalm to make a truth claim to make an indictment of human hearts. And the word of God is powerful. It is without error. It is breathed out by God and so can be studied at the detail level. It can be exegeted. It can be researched. And it yields truth because it's God's word. Christian, we have no authority of our own. We can't settle theological disputes with our ideas, with wranglings, with philosophies, with meanderings, and with logic. But with the logos, the very word of God, the, the outbreathing of God's mind on the pages of Holy Scripture, that's our authority. Even Jesus, the word of God incarnate, employed that authority in his ministry. Secondly, just think about how God the Son, in all of his gracious dealings with us, mixed up humanity. How he was hated, mistreated, ignored, neglected, rejected. If you and I follow Jesus, we should expect to be mistreated, neglected, rejected, maligned. We will be seen as enemies of what the world calls good in all of its darkness. Following their father, the God of this world, Satan, the world around us has flipped God's script, calling good evil and evil good. And if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you you will be maligned as a no good, immoral bad person for holding up the light of truth and light and goodness and compassion and mercy and grace. Just expect that, Christian. It was normal for Jesus. It will be normal for those who follow. A third thought for us this morning is that truth wins. Truth wins. Corrupt leaders may corruptly lead for a time. Arguments may seem so confounding to us that we cannot surmount them. Boy, that atheist said something really intelligent and it confused me. Just stand on the truth, Christian. The truth wins. Silly, convoluted, complicated, impressive arguments have nothing on the truth. Jesus is the truth. Stand with him, take confidence. To be mistreated, maligned, even to perish at the hands of evildoers. To be persecuted unto unto death, but to be on the right side of truth means life eternal. Be on the right side of the truth. Fourth, this morning. Keep your Christological hope. That is, look forward in anticipation of the fulfillment of what Jesus himself has promised. Jesus sees every injustice. Nothing is outside of his watch and care. Trust. Trust him. Entrust yourself to a faithful creator and wait. All will be set right. Never assume that evildoers will just get away with it. They won't. Nobody gets away with anything. 
If you start to envy evildoers, if you start to be jealous of what looks like an easy life for them, go back and read Psalm 37 and Psalm 73. Consider the slippery places on which they stand. They will not last. They're headed to destruction. If you give up on that and you give in to envy, Man, it just seems like godless people get everything they want. It seems following Jesus is so hard, and, and the people that don't live to the, the, the strict standards of God's word, it just seems like they have an easier life. You give in to that. You are giving in to not only hopelessness, but you give in to joining them in darkness. Christian, you, you've already seen that darkness, you know where it leads. It is a dead end, eternally dead. Keep your Christological hope. And fifthly and finally this morning, beware a cold, indifferent, or hostile heart toward God. It's possible to be close to God's word and yet far from him. The religious leadership of Jesus' day they were the keepers of the oracles of God. They were the copiers of Scripture. They were the teachers of God's Word. They claimed to be the representative of God's very voice to the people. And they missed Him altogether. The Word of God came and stood in their midst, and they did not recognize Him. Or worse, they recognized Him and sought to kill him. What will your heart do if you are indifferent to God's word when it is close to you? Friend, today is the day of salvation. If you find yourself here this morning and have never surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ, just know that surrender to Jesus is sweet. It is good. There is nowhere else you will have life Nowhere else you can have hope. Everything else is a lie and is darkness. You choose against Jesus, you will only find death and misery and destruction. And it might fool you for a while. It might look good for a little while. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. If you don't know Jesus, turn to Jesus while you can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what gracious words on the pen of a psalmist, on the lips of your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to reveal who he really is, to put before us these striking claims. For a Jesus of Nazareth is not God. We waste our time. We close these books and we walk away forever. But if Jesus of Nazareth is God in the flesh, then we must do nothing else but get right with him. And I beg on behalf of anyone listening this morning that you would soften a heart And draw to repentance those who are clinging to silly things, lifeless things, death-bringing things, instead of Christ. Oh Lord Jesus, would you cause us all to worship you all the more. To see you for who you are. To be in awe of your glory, your splendor, your grace and kindness and patience. Oh, how you have borne with us. You've borne with the world in all of its wickedness. You have borne with humanity as a race, and you have borne with each one of us in our rebellions. Thank you, O oh God, for making us alive, for doing away in us those hard hearts and those recesses which were in rebellion to you. Make us fully and completely yours in all of our ways and all of our thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen.